Welcome back to Plenary Session. I'm joined by friend of the show, Dr. Timothy Olivier, who is now an attending oncologist, sarcoma and head and neck expert in Geneva, Switzerland. Timothy and I are going to be talking about the Natalie study. This is adjuvant breast cancer. These are where you get the big split in DFS curves. Timothy, it's great to have you yeah. back. The big split. Thanks, Vinay. It's great yeah. to be here again. Uh, so should we get started? Yeah, let's get started. So what okay, do we need to know great. about Natalie? Yeah. So what you need to know is a recent New England paper, okay? Ribociclib plus endocrine therapy in early breast cancer. So here are the inclusion criteria of Natalie. So basically, hair positive, hair to negative, early breast cancer. And as you can see, and this is a big difference with Monarch E. We have abemaciclib in Monarch E as an adjuvant treatment for two years. And in Monarch E, you had to be N, uh, node positive. Here, as you can see, you can be included in the trial even if you are N0, according to some criteria. And so I think this is a big difference with uh, Monarch E, and we'll go back to that. So it's really huge criteria. Many, many patients had this early stage breast cancer and have been included in this trial. So the design is ribociclib. 400 milligrams a day, three weeks off, uh, three weeks on, one weeks off, plus letrozole or anastrozole, and gosseroling in men or premenopausal women. So you could be included if you would, if you would be postmenopausal or premenopausal, and the control arm was non serodal uh, aromatase inhibitor alone. Again, mm -hmm. with gosserolin or not, according to your. Uh, menopausal status. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question at this point? No, I think pretty logical. I mean, uh, you know, for younger women, they want to do ovarian suppression. You know, there's some older data that suggests that that uh, uh, has some small benefit. Um, and ribocyclo plus or minus, um, I might have yeah. made it, you could use any AI you wanted, made it even more open. But, uh, and of course, the yeah. primary endpoint is garbage, you know, but we'll come yeah. to that. Yeah, oh, and three years, three years. That's a nice. Yeah, three years. Yeah. So, so, so I think it's important. Yeah. The primary endpoint is invasive GFS, and I will just um, say something about that. I will go back to your point about about this control arm uh, later in the in the show, because at some point it, it 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 you will see you will see my point. Okay. So just to define the invasive GFS, as you see, it's a composite endpoint. <coughs> uh, you you could have all these kind of endpoints that. Mm -hmm count as an event you you talk a lot about that on the show so i don't know if you want to tell something about that now or mm, i think that these are composite time to event endpoints that yeah. uh, anushka wally and i wrote a very nice paper on i think in nature views clinical oncology about all of these and uh these are nice way to see the fact that not everything goes into the bed, the endpoint um, yeah ipsilateral and contralateral DCIS is omitted from the IDFS endpoint, but it is in the DFS endpoint. This yeah. is a nice figure you've got here. Where does this come from? Yeah, so, who, so, who so, really, so really, this is a figure coming from the supplement of the paper, and I have, to, I have to really congratulate the authors because they put this, and as you will see, they will put the breakdown of the EGFS events. So this is pretty rare, and I will, go back to the, uh, I will come back to that later. But I think this is really nice to have this in the paper. So we'll go very fast on the characteristic of patient. As you can see, there's a, a kind of balance between premenopausal women and postmenopausal women. Uh, very few men, 40% um, stage two, 60% stage three, 16% node negative. So, you know, not so far from monarchy in a sense, and 12% 12 12 did not receive chemotherapy. So. This is also a sign of the risk, you know, you were talking about the, you were talking about the, the, the addition of glycerin in a premenopausal woman, and this is a, um, usually based on the risk um, mm. in this population. Yeah. So now the main result, and don't tell something because I will just quote you in a, in, in, in a minute. So you can see the, 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 the you can see the, the curve and here is your tweet when you saw these curves. So uh, can, you, can, you, can you comment on that? 
Yeah, if you can fit a laser pointer between the curves, you can give the ASCO plenary. I mean, yeah. just looking at that, that's a very marginal difference in a surrogate endpoint, um, very tiny sliver. I think so, for most of the curve, you can't even fit a laser pointer. So I took it to the task, and I tried to fit the laser <laughs> point, and it's just here, as you can see, uh, it was not so easy. It was not so easy. And look, one more irresponsible thing. Look how they're showing you outcomes at 42 and 48 months. That's so ridiculous. You start yeah. with 2,500 people and you show me outcomes for 12 people. It's ridiculous. And if they didn't show you that, it would look even more pathetic. I think that's why so, they want to take it out that far. Yeah, yeah. So that's the main result, of course. So the primary endpoint was invasive GFS. So this is invasive GFS. Mm -hmm. It's statistically significant. As you can see, there is, um, there is a, a, a difference, an absolute difference uh, at three, three years. Uh, that is 3.3%. And um, this is really the main result. They are also presenting the secondary endpoints, but we won't go to, 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 to this uh, today. Um, one slide regarding the adverse events and I just um, noticed that um, we there is grade five um, grade five adverse events that are more common in the ribociclip group as in the um, uh, control group um, they said that there were no treatment related deaths in the ribociclip group and we will discuss about that because uh, um, there is this COVID-19 related deaths that are more common with ribociclib as compared to the control group. You can see here it's mentioned three, but actually it's more. In the supplement, the, 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 the numbers are a bit, uh, are a bit uh, uh, different, so there's a question mark here. But this is basically the adverse event. And as you can see, there is an issue with neutropenia, which is uh, pretty frequent. And also, I think the more uh, the other uh, important um, thing to look at is um, uh, the liver toxicity that can uh, can be uh, uh, problematic. But this is scary to me because you have a tripling of grade five, which means dead, dead adverse events. So these mm. are attributed by the investigator. The patient is dead as a result of taking the drug. And these women are not supposed to die. Look at the other. I mean, so, the control so, arm is so, so, yeah, two-tenths so, of one percent so, death rate. So to be, to be precise, these are not treatment-related adverse events, as you know. And, and I think this is a a common issue uh, across trials because you have these treatment-related adverse events and they said no treatment-related uh, uh, toxic death. But when you see treatment emergent adverse event, because we all know that you can have an adverse event or toxic death and regarding the trialist, regarding some, some consideration, it can be attributed to treatment or no. But we know that it's, it can it can be you know it's not uh, it's not a perfect way to to answer the question. You yeah, see my I point? mean, in my mind, attributing treatment events makes no sense in a randomized study. Any difference yeah. in the number is attributable. You don't need an investigator to make their call if they think it's attributable or not. In this case, I would say it looks bad. I mean, it's not looking yeah, good. Yeah, it's not it looking good. It, lo it, 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 it looks concerning. It's looking concerning. concerning. Yeah. yeah. Now, is yeah. it going to be significant with a bigger data set? You know, we don't know those things, but it's not yeah. looking good. Yeah. Okay, point number one. I like so this. Point, po yeah, so point <laughs> number one, I just want you to imagine what is a point number one. This, can, this is a tribute to the Vinay Prasad way of uh, looking at trials. So let, 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 let's imagine what is the point number one. The point number is one the, is, is, is the control arm what you would have done in your practice. No, 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 your, your usual point number one. Clinical endpoint or surrogate endpoint? Sample size? Vinay, no. Vinay, Vinay. Oh, medical writers. <laughs> of course. Medical I got writers. you. Got you. Got you. You're right. You're right. It's my, so, my number one is medical. Who wrote I mean, the paper? I mean, that, <laughs> that was a tribute to you. That was a tribute to you, to your way of, of appraising the, the, the paper. So, okay. So this, this is a, a, a usual point that you are making. And here again, you know, this is more about, uh, I think, um, what you already said. And uh, Jan Tanok wrote a, a nice paper about that also, I think, two or three years ago in Annals of Oncology about the fact that we should write our own academic uh, works, in a sense. Do you want to comment on that or not? Yeah, really? I mean, I think it's pathetic. If you get someone else to write your paper, it shouldn't be used for your promotion. Somebody else wrote it. So it should be used for the medical writer's promotion in the company. Let's go to the point number two. So here I really put what I think is the most important potential issue, which is informative censoring. 
Yeah. And I know it can sound technical, but you will explain this uh, with me to, 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 to the audience. But I think it's really, really uh, important here. So we know, uh, thanks to the, to the reporting in the supplement, that 100, uh, 110 patients did not receive study treatment in the control arm and 23 patients did not receive the treatment in the ribo-containing arm. So this is really making a huge imbalance right at the beginning of people that won't receive the treatment as compared to patients that will receive the, the, the treatment. And why it's concerning is because we know that patients that will left the trial are not the same that people that will stay in the trial. Do you want to, to comment on that or to, to explain it maybe better than me? Yeah, it looks like immediately after randomization, wow, and you're right about those percentages. It's a big imbalance. There's a big imbalance in the number of people who ostensibly drop out. And who are the people who drop out early in the randomized study? This is not a blinded study, it's open label. Yeah, it's open label, and I think this is really a concerning point. Why this was open label? Because you could afford a placebo. We will yeah. come to why is this open label? Yeah, so it's yeah. open label. So people in the control arm, they're disappointed they didn't get uh, ribocyclib, and four point three percent are dropping out. An extra three percent of people are those people dropping out at random? I doubt it. They're probably the most wealthy, well-educated, well-connected, affluent people who would have otherwise had better IDFS outcomes. So this to me is a, a big imbalance in did not receive treatment and dropout. Yeah, it's a problem. And, and, and the, problem, the, the point I want to make it is, I think it's affecting EGFS, but it, it can also affect overall survival. Of we course, don't have it can an, affect an, OS, an, yeah. yeah, yeah. So just a, a point, because we are doing a lot of this in, in our works, but we can reconstruct the curve. And so I did that here, and uh, we talked about that already. Um, but you can make an estimate of patients censored at each time point. So I did that here, and you can, I mean, people that want to, to do the, the code, they can run the analysis, the code is uh, mentioned here. But basically, after six months, you know, here it's just immediately, just after randomization. But after six months, it's also a big imbalance. So yeah. you have more people dropping out yeah. after, after this randomization. So it's really something that is really um, uh, occurring early and I think it's very concerning so um, maybe I, I go to the next slide to show yeah. why it's concerning because I run a very conservative sen uh, sensitivity analysis so based on this synthetic uh, patient data mm -hmm. I modified the fate of the censored patient 10% of the censored patient during the first time point yeah. in each arm yeah, that's With not some, that many. You know, that's not that many. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's very. I mean, ten percent first time point, and I modified uh, according to some assumption. And with this very, very conservative estimate, and people can redo the code. They can redo all the statistical significance fade away. Mm -hmm. So it really, you know, it really shows you why yeah. informative censoring is important. Because yeah. if the events or if the fate of those patients are different, this can really affect your results. Great point. Do you, I mean, do you want to, to comment on that? Because I think, you know, informative censoring is, is underappreciated as, as, <coughs> as, a, as a really important po point in, in interpreting trials. Yeah, yeah. you know that um, Usama Bilal and I did that paper many years ago about this and Bolero and I've been interested in this for a long time. But I think you're absolutely right, which is that a randomized trial balances the outcome distribution in the absence of a therapeutic effect. But that's only true if the two groups are randomly assigned. But the moment yeah. one group starts to get more dropout than the other, the moment one group starts to get different reasons for dropout than the other, the moment that assumption of randomization starts to go away. And there may be differences in the outcomes that have nothing to do with the treatment that have to do with who happened to stay and who yeah. happened to go. And here, yeah. if you know open label study, you don't get what you wanted, ribocyclib, and you drop out, who are those people 
Are they the average person or do they, they are they sort of wealthy or well-connected people? If they're wealthy or well-connected, were they going to do better? And does that mean the people who you followed and measured did worse? And what you're saying is that even if you were to make very subtle assumptions about who drops out, very conservative assumptions, this whole trial goes from one where you can barely fit a laser pointer to one where you can't fit a laser pointer. Yeah, and that's absolutely. another point. The effect size was already so marginal yeah, that it doesn't yeah. take much to make it wither away entirely. Yeah, yeah. Good. I like this. Okay. Yeah. Why open label? It's bullshit. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, really, you know, and, and we will talk about the financial toxicity because the cost for to avoid one event is, is really massive. But how can the company cannot afford a, a placebo pill? I mean, this is, I don't understand. There's no ju justification. And I think it's a core issue because this is also the reason why you have this kind of imbalance in censoring because patients know that they don't have a ribociclob, ribociclib or they have ribociclib. They know it because it's open label. So I think it's really, you know, polluting the, their trial because of this open label, label design. I'm surprised if you let them get away with it. Yeah. Point number four, and here's a figure I took from your paper that you mentioned previously. So EGFS is a time to event composite endpoint. And very often, and this was in, in your paper, very often it's not, you know, not reported in details. There's no breakdown, as you can see here. And uh, Anushka Walia was the, the first author. She, she did a great job. But here in, in 46 trials, it was not reported the breakdown. So here we have the breakdown. And I think it's really great. And <coughs> as you can see, the, the, the first EGFS GFS event can be Inv invasive, ipsilateral breast cancer, local regional, distant recurrence, deaths and things and that. So the first, the first thing I did, you know, because we, we, we very often we speak about disease-free survival, is it meaningful, should we change uh, the name, the survival part and things like that. I think the most important thing is to really describe what is the event. And here you can really calculate that the part of the survival in these disease invasive disease-free survival events is really minimal. It's 6.9% in the ribociclib arm and 3% in the, the control arm. So I think this should be part of the explanation to your patient, even if it's really a, a, reli a reliable estimate, the survival part of the benefit is minimal. Go back a slide. Hmm. Death. So I just I just divided the number of deaths by yeah. the number of events. But, uh, but I feel like yeah. it's even worse because you're saying that survival is a small part of DFS. Go back one. Yeah. Survival is worse if you got ribocyclib. Survival yeah. uh, is worse okay, if you okay, get ribocyclib. Okay, okay. It's more yeah, death. Yeah, yeah. Huh? yeah. Okay. I will, I will come back to that um, yeah. uh, regarding the toxicity. We cannot really say that survival was worse because overall survival was uh, not yeah. different and the hazard ratio is... Uh, 0.73 or, or but not significant but but, but yeah there is a, a real concern about this I, I agree I, I'll come back to that uh, okay. later yeah wait it's a distant recurrence but, of the event okay go back one more time I want to look at one more yeah second. yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. also if you the local regional is local and regional should have been separated that's one and mm -hmm. contralateral breast cancer is not as important to me and local failure can be treated with surgery um and even regional yeah. can be treated with surgery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think what is important here, you can see that there are some some of these endpoints okay. that are. You have to. No, it's okay. No, no, no. Yeah, continue. There, yeah, some okay. of these endpoints are not as important as other endpoints. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Point number five: large inclusion criteria. I don't. I don't think it's uh, it's as strong here, but you know, it's just you know, I just cited your paper. It, it was about PTL one and nested and adjacent subgroup. But I really feel that they want to get the more and more people, and and I just illustrate this here with the N plus. You know, it was uh, a, a monarchy, and now they met N plus and N zero. They they you know do large large inclusion criteria, and if they get the 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 p value then they get the, the market share and i think it's uh it's not uh it's not really informing our practice i don't know don't know if you want to comment on that no i mean this is a good point you can go forward so this is a maybe a, a mooder point but i think there's a, a, an over treatment for a fraction of patients that are in premenopausal premenopausal uh, status 
And here, just um, a, a sub subtlety in the protocol, patient could have received any adjuvant endocrine therapy for up to 12 months before randomization. And mm. if you go in the table one again, you can see that before being randomized, 13.5% of them were probably received tamoxifen. So I think there can be some of these patients that being in the trial were changed to receive anastrozole or letrozole plus goserelin, but may have been overtreated in that sense. And it, it's not a big point, but I think it's a... Wait, it's may a, have been overtreated, you're saying? Say it again? Yeah, because those patients, because they were enrolled in the trial, they had to take as the endocrine part uh, non-steroidal uh, aromatase inhibitor plus glycerin, but they were not you, allowed to, you, do to you take the moxifen. Do you have to take the if you're premenopausal? You have to take yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's, beca that's because, uh, beca yeah. So, uh, uh, and th this is, uh, I think, explained by uh, an issue with ribocyclic plus tamoxifen, uh, Q uh, QT prolongation and, and other things. But as you can see, there were some patients, 13.4 patients, before being randomized, they received tamoxifen, and then they were switched because of being in the trial to a more intensive uh, uh, endocrine therapy. So, so why is that bad? Because they're at low risk. They don't really I mean, need it. I mean, the, the I mean, absolute yeah, benefit I, I, of this is going to be tiny, and there's toxicity. I mean, yeah, it be, because it's not, it's not, you know, it's not indicated in all patient in all premenopausal no. patient. It, it, and so, the benefit is, is slight. It's a small benefit, and it's a bill. So, and, and also, it's it's very uh, uncomfortable to take ovarian suppression. It's so yeah, fun. so it's so so it's more. I mean, I think everybody agree that it's uh, more toxic and uh, a lot of side effects. So, you know, it's a concern about those patients that probably were over treated and and we don't have all the data to to really you know make this statement strong but and there were on tamoxy ribocyclic yeah. plus tamoxifen causes uh um QT, it causes QT, qt prolongation yeah yeah qt prolongation there was some issue uh, about that and and uh, um i know that there are also some issue about um, ribocyclic increasing the concentration of tamoxifen uh because of cytochrome interaction so mm -hmm. i think that was the main reason but in a sense, you know, when you see that, I have a. It's a. It's yeah. a, it's maybe a. a, it's a, a, not, it's a, a not a very. It's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go on. What's point seven? So point seven. I don't. Mm. Maybe you can comment on that. But you know, you have this uh, inflation in sample size, and it's really you know the 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 the, the point of statistical significance and clinical si significance. Um, I think we we talk a lot about that already on this channel, but. Do you want to, to, to add something? I mean, you have to, you, there were 5,100 patients randomized. And let's imagine all the, the clinical questions you can answer with uh, so much patients. And to me, it's a bit frustrating. I mean, yeah, it's really frustrating. I mean, with huge sample size, you're powered to find statistically significant, but clinically irrelevant distinctions. And that's precisely what you see here. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I mean, Come on, the actual IDFS <laughs> benefit is a sliver. We started with a sliver. Okay, let's do toxicity. Yes. Yeah, toxicity. So going back to this slide, and you you have this uh, any adverse events twelve versus four. Then they again they made a good job. They are providing a lot of tables, and I, I want to to know what you think about that. So you have the overall death. Okay, adverse events. So adverse events to me means that it occurred under treatment, right? You are not sure it's related to treatment, but it occurred under treatment. If not, you don't call these adverse events. You call I mean, these it had to have other, occurred in the yeah. first three years, you think? And it had to have occurred in the absence of disease recurrence. So, Death so in the absence of disease recurrence. So, so it's an open question to me, but they provided another you know, table that I find very interesting on yeah, treatment death. So, so yeah. yeah. So six uh, people in the ribocyclic arm plus, um, plus hormone therapy uh, died, uh, I think they died from COVID. Yeah, yeah, they are, they are on treatment. Died. So six people, uh, six patients in the, um, in the ribo arm died from COVID-19 and one in the control arm. And again, if you come back here, I don't know why it's three here and not six. I, I think it's a mistake maybe, I don't know. You know, it's wait, go, six go, go, back, go back, go back to that other table. Yeah, hold on, wait one second. Also, more people test positive for COVID. Look at test positive. It's up 7%. Yeah. 
12, I mean, so not only, I mean, one, my first thought was, is it plausible people are dying of COVID more? Sure, it's immunosuppressive, but I would also assume they're getting more COVID in the first place. They are, they're 7% more likely to get COVID, 12 to 19, you know? So they're getting yeah. more COVID, it makes them susceptible to COVID and they're dying yeah. from COVID more. Okay, so the story kind of hangs together that these are real deaths. Uh, yeah. And so here it's three, here it's six, so I, I don't know really why, but yeah. They, they and I bet they all got vaccinated. I don't know. I bet. I bet. I don't know. The type of know. people in these studies are heavily vaccinated, but go on. So this, I think, will be my last, last point. I mean, we could, could go on and on, but, um, you know, I did this calculation. We already did that previously. I will come back to this paper we did uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But um, you calculate the number need to treat, okay? Then you calculate the average estimate co estimated cost per patient. So for one patient, so I really again took, I think, a conservative estimate. So I, uh, you know, uh, consider the patient that were dose reduced, and I assume that were dose reduced uh, beginning the first month uh, during the whole, uh, the whole treatment. And, you know, I did this kind of estimation. And then when you multiply the number need to treat by the estimated average mm -hmm. cost per patient, you end to 11 million 200,000 million. Uh, dollars to avoid one EGFS event. So mm -hmm. this is um, very impressive because we did this uh, analysis yeah. a few years ago and our maximum was two million uh, and six, I think it was Pembro in Brest, but now it's exploding. I mean, 11 million. And uh, I don't know what to say more about that. I see this. you are checking your phone. I, I see know, I'm, you. I'm looking at you. the Natalie study. <laughs> so this was everybody with hormone receptor positive, early breast cancer. The eligible population is huge. The budgetary impact will be devastating. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what I was checking. Yeah. This I is wanted, a headshot. I wanted, uh, uh, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to, I mean, uh, uh, it's good you asked the question. I wanted to estimate the market share. but Yeah, the yeah. market share. That was my first question. The market share is going to be yeah. billions plus. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a terrible study. Um, so these are my, you know, yeah. points. I think it's not practi practice changing. Informative censoring is uh, likely to me. Um, and this can affect EGFS, but also OS. Yeah. You know, many people on, on, on Twitter, they say we are waiting for overall survival. Um, there were also many key opinion leaders that were pretty, you know, critical about the, the study. So, so uh, I have to be fair, but you know, I don't, I don't want really, I don't really, I'm not really waiting for our survival. I want data sharing. I want sensitivity analysis, like it was done for code break 200, for instance. Um, I would really want to know if those deaths, you know, COVID-19 related deaths were, you know, in the context of neutropenia. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I won't repeat all what I said, but uh, this was my uh, quick take on, on the Natalie trial. I was really interested because I think it's really, you know, we are crossing a, a, a bar with this uh, kind of trial and yeah. Yeah, well done. Yeah, I think you're, now that I see your points, the informative censoring is the strongest point in my opinion. Yeah, that's why I, I really started with that because yeah. You know, even when you go into the into the um, the subgroup analysis, you see that the benefit I will call that benefit is seen across all subgroups. You know, but if the benefit in the first place is skewed by informative censoring, you will find it in every subgroup. Of so course. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, if so, it's not, so if it's not I randomized. Yeah. It's not randomized. Yeah. The other, so, the other so point th I would make is that even if the results were true, it will be useful for these breast cancer researchers to to put tables of the absolute benefit by breast cancer risk, which is both stage, molecular characteristics, et cetera. Mm, because mm. some of these ultra low risk women are gonna take this for three years, take yeah. huge risks in infection and have almost no Im reduction in IDFS, you know, even if it were a well done study, but yeah. it's not a well done study. It's got all these problems. All right. Well done, Timothy. Any closing thoughts so, on this? Yeah. No, no. I I just wanted to share this with you and to have uh, to make it uh, interactive like that. And uh, and uh, thank you for having me on the show. And, this is great. Uh, I'm going to put this out on the Plenary Session podcast. And you need to write this up. This should be a manuscript too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are. We are. I mean, you know, we are thinking about it. We'll do it together. No, oh, well, somebody else listens. will probably do it too. That's how they like to do it. 
Uh, no, no, right. no comment. No comment. On okay, that okay. positive <laughs> note, we'll be back on that with more note. plenary session. I'm going to do some more cardiology stuff coming up soon. All right. Until thank, next time. Thank you.